Welcome to the Digital Experience by MAPE. These webinars are intended to be interactive, but for the purpose of time, your questions can be posted in the chat box. The presenter will address a question and the answer at the end of the session. The presenter's email contact information will also be provided at the end of the session if you prefer to reach out to them directly. Here's some information about today's presenter. Rankin Jays is the Coatings Business Development Leader for MAPE's Concrete Restoration Systems line. After immigrating to the United States in 1997, Rankin worked with Parker Paint as Director of Channel Sales and Marketing, covering the Pacific Northwest market. When Parker was acquired by the Comex Group in 2005, Rankin transferred to Color Wheel Paint in Orlando, where he remained as National Product Director until 2001. He then spent several years with Stowe Corporation in Atlanta as product marketing manager for the company's coding division. Rankin has been in his current role as business development leader with MyPay since 2015. Rankin holds a BS in psychology and a master's degree in business administration from, unities, from universities in New Zealand. Please silence your phones. We appreciate your attendance. Here is Rankin Jays. Thanks, Princess. Appreciate the, uh, the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you might be. Um, thank you for attending today and um, welcome to this, uh, this webinar. It's entitled Concrete Deterioration and Impact on Coatings Performance and Design. And we'll just get the slides moving here. Okay. Um, so, um, what we're looking at today is the um, reviewing the uh, types and causes of concrete deterioration and develop an understanding of specific features of coating technology to improve the durability and lifespan of concrete structures. Um, want to take a look at uh, the environmental and service related causes of concrete deterioration and the, the effects that they have on the structure. Um, we'll understand the um, the objectives behind specifying protective coatings for concrete um, and the potential contribution they have on uh, environmental and economic sustainability. We'll also identify specific performance measures of uh, coating systems and understand how these can counteract the environmental effects of con concrete deterioration. Um, and lastly, I want to compare some specific data points to assess the uh, absolute and relative performance of, uh, of coating systems both in theory and in practice. So jumping into this, I want to start with a, so, you know, a couple of concrete basics and uh, understand that concrete is the most widely used man-made product in the world. Concept dates back to ancient times, obviously, but it wasn't until the 18th century that the use of hydraulic lime was actually pioneered. Traditionally, it's a very simple cement um, mixed with graded aggregates in water. It's now a much more complicated uh, concoction of uh, chemical reactions with admixtures uh, to enjoy uh, to uh, ensure durability and, and longevity. The advantage concrete has is it's uh, relatively low cost, uh, great stiffness, excellent compressive strength, relatively easy, uh, easy to fabricate with. It's non-flammable and is a, a very stable substrate. Um, on, a, on, the, on the downside, however, it has very low tensile strength. Uh, it is brittle and lacks long-term durability. And that's a, somewhat of a relative term. We see, we see concrete structures standing for centuries, but uh, as we get into this, you'll see what, what we're talking about in terms of deterioration and how that it does impact uh, that comment about long-term durability. So concrete hardens through the process of hydration and during the curing process, calcium hydroxide is formed, creating a very high pH condition uh, within the concrete. It forms a passive layer around the reinforcing steel that retards corrosion. But sooner or later, defects that define uh, deterioration will start to appear. Concrete structures deteriorate uh, with time and much faster in extreme environments associated with high humidity, presence of chlorides, CO2 in the atmosphere, wet and dry cycling. Um, ingress of damaging substances takes place through the pores of the concrete by the process of diffusion, and that really starts to initiate the corrosion of the reinforcing steel. 
uh, onset of corrosion of the uh, of the steel is accelerated when that uh, high pH condition or that passivating layer around the reinforcing is destroyed um, by reducing the alkalinity within the within the concrete structure uh, or within the concrete matrix itself. So that then uh, the, the the steel corrodes, then creates a, uh, a concrete spall, uh, and that ultimately reduces the strength, aesthetics, and integrity of the structure. So that's that's pretty it, pretty much it in a nutshell. But um, the components of deterioration generally fall into four camps: uh, chemical deterioration, physical, mechanical, and then defects that. Uh, um, might be entrained during installation or, or as part of the design mix. So we'll take a look at some of those. Carbonation is uh, is the first one, and that occurs when CO2 present naturally uh, occurring in the atmosphere uh, penetrates the concrete and reacts with the calcium hydroxide in the in the concrete, and that produces calcium carbonate, or it turns essentially turns the concrete to chalk. Um, the reaction reduces the pH of the uh, concrete pore solution, destabilizing that passivating layer. Carbonation is generally a very slow process uh, and depends greatly on relative humidity, temperature, and overall concrete quality. There's plenty of predictive models out there, uh, including accelerated carbonation tests, simulating variable factors responsible for acceleration of carbonation. But the, um, the one that really puts it in fairly simple terms for me is actually this Brown's equation that says we take, uh, let's say, 5,500 uh, 5, PSI concrete, um, a carbon under under normal normal conditions, a carbonation wave front will extend into concrete just under one inch, seven eighths of an inch, in a period of 20 years. Okay, so it is slow, but uh, and if that was the only thing that um, only thing that happened to concrete, yeah, it would. You know that's a that's a fairly durable life cycle of a of a concrete structure, but we're talking about a cumulative effect of a number of other uh, uh, a number of other deterioration effects as well. Um, sulfate attack uh, occurs when naturally uh, occurring sulfates of sodium, calcium, magnesium can be found in the soil and groundwater, and uh, as soluble ions, they're carried into the concrete matrix by uh, by by water. That reacts with the hydrated compounds in the hardened cement and expand, and that can produce sufficient internal pressure that it can cause a loss of cohesion and strength. Concrete exposed to a higher frequency of wet and dry cycling and porous concrete is much more uh, much more at risk. Chloride ingress: um, you know, two thirds of this, uh, two thirds of our population actually live in in coastal states. Uh, one third of our population actually lived in uh, coastal counties, so you know they're a very aggressive environment um, with the uh, with the uh, salt laden sea air. Um, and chloride ingress is really the primary cause of corrosion of steel reinforcement. Um, chloride ions are also present in the de-icing salts we use on our roads during the uh, uh, during the winter time. Uh, airborne pollutants, as I mentioned, salt laden sea air. Um, uh, and even some concrete admixtures also uh, contain chloride uh, chloride ions. Um, these dissolved in water permeate sound concrete and reach steel through uh, through defects. Carbonation also lowers the amount of chloride ions needed to uh, promote corrosion. And depending on relative humidity, temperature, chloride concentration, wet and dry cycling, etc., chloride penetration can reach one to two and a half inches into ordinary Portland cement in as little as five years. And typically, we're talking about only a, a two-inch cover on uh, reinforcing. So you can see how aggressive this can be in in really uh, creating a problem for uh, for concrete structures. Um, freeze thaw is also a bit of an issue um, where uh, where water is allowed to seep into concrete, where it might freeze and then it expands by about nine percent by volume. Um, in um, Moist concrete, this can uh, produce sufficient internal pressure within the pores and capillaries of the concrete to exceed the tensile strength of the concrete. And then we start seeing uh, seeing those cavities dilate and rupture. And ultimately, we see scaling and cracking and, or crumbling of concrete. A couple of good examples there with uh, a sidewalk or a, uh, a, 
a, a brown coat over a scratch where uh, where water has been allowed to allowed to freeze. Uh, effects of high temperature also can on, on concrete can also be destructive, not necessarily to the concrete itself, um, although the um, expansion of uh, of some aggregates can also create these thermal spores. But more frequently, it is actually the expansion of the uh, reinforcing steel that creates the internal um, internal pressures to uh, to overcome the tensile strength of the concrete as well, and uh, prolonged. Temperatures above 500 degrees C, we'll see the reinforcing melt and uh, the tensile strength of the, the entire structure is lost at that point. Plastic shrinkage, this typically occurs during the uh, hydration process where there's a rapid loss of moisture on the surface. And uh, as a result, tensile stresses between the, uh, the, the softer concrete below and the, the, the harder drying surface above um create some uh, internal stress and then we end up with cracks um propagating through the through the uh, concrete cross section as you can see there the varying depths and once again i and now it's a direct route for uh for contaminants and chloride ions particularly to uh, to start uh, their their uh, the journey towards the uh, the reinforcing Uh, abrasion impact and erosion also things to consider in our uh, in our uh, assessment of uh, concrete deterioration. Um, just the effects of normal maintenance and wear and tear on the concrete surface, such as a a, a snowplow, given the example of that that parking garage on the on the right there, or uh, the constant dripping of water onto a concrete surface, is sufficient to erode the uh, erode the concrete itself. Then of course the H factor where humans get involved. And while we can repair uh, many of this, much of this damage, we'll always have that cold joint, and that becomes the uh, the, the 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 weak point or the 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 point of entry for uh, or the, the 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 point of entry for for contamination and uh, deterioration to restart. Installation defects. This can occur um, frequently. Um, you know, the positioning of uh, of formwork is critical. Although this is an ICF form, you can see how wavy that is and doesn't give the uh, the reinforcing the entire uh, two inches that's normally required in the uh, in the in the building code. But um, through um, over compaction, we can uh, see a separation of the larger and the small aggregates, as you see there in the middle, um, which results in an uneven stiffness or strength across that cross section. Uh, a lack of cover. As I mentioned, with the uh, positioning of formwork, really leaves the rebar exposed at the um, uh, very near the surface. Um, under compaction, we can end up with uh, honeycombing, uh, bug holes, and things like that. Um, obviously, a uh, reducing our, our effective cover over reinforcing, but also a, uh, a, a gateway for for uh, contaminants to start uh, start their entrance into the into the concrete and ultimately we end up with things like um, spalls but also efflorescence where uh, where uh, soluble salts are uh, washed out of the out of the concrete matrix so knowing what we know about concrete now let's talk take a look at um, coating solutions or waterproofing solutions for for concrete and I did put an asterisk there uh, ahead of waterproofing because I, I, I in a couple of slides, on I'll just give you a definition on the on the waterproofing. So we talk about waterproofing and uh, weatherproofing and damp proofing fairly uh, fairly freely, and uh, assume everybody knows what we mean by those terms. But it's um, there is a distinction. But um, regardless of the condition or quality of uh, of concrete, it'll be, remain both permeable and porous and subject to deterioration as a result of the presence of moisture in the structure. Chloride ingress, ASR, freeze thaw, sulfate attack, they all require the presence of moisture to act as a vehicle or to transport soluble ions into the concrete matrix. With moisture being the root cause or key contributing factor to concrete deterioration, in my view, it should be preferred that concrete is treated or, uh, or waterproof to protect against that moisture infiltration, either as, as water, water vapor, and also uh, protect against CO2 diffusion. 
and this is the distinction I wanted to make where we talk about waterproofing. That's the treatment of the uh, of a surface uh, structured to resist the uh, passage of water under hydrostatic pressure. Um, damp proofing by, uh, by contrast or, or weather proofing is the treatment of a surface structure to resist passage of water in the absence of hydrostatic pressure. So we really need, um, it's really in that below grade uh, condition where we talk about waterproofing. And uh, just a little bit of trivia there to understand the, the extent of hydro, what, what hydrostatic pressure is or the, or the uh, magnitude of hydrostatic pressure. Uh, a column of uh, uh, one foot of fresh water exerts approximately uh, 0.43 PSI or, or the converse of that or the, uh, the opposite of that would be one PSI of fresh water would require a column of water 28 inches high. So the question there is when we're talking about above grade waterproofing, it doesn't really, uh, it's not really subject to hydrostatic pressure. So yeah, we're really talking about weatherproofing or damp proofing, but as I said earlier, the, those terms are, are very, are freely used and are very much interchangeable, but uh, there are certain conditions that separate waterproofing from, from the other things. So crystalline waterproofing, is um, can be employed either as an admixture or as a surface treatment. Um, uh, this act, uh, these chemicals react uh, with the available water uh, and crystalline structures develop within the open pores and capillaries and hairline cracks of the concrete to seal against further moisture ingress. Understanding that the concrete is full of pores and capillaries. Yeah, this uh, this now creates an additional growth of these crystalline structures to to prevent uh, prevent uh, prevent moisture in, ingress. Um, it becomes a, uh, an integral part of the concrete and will continue to react with the available water. It's recommended for typically on the negative side or positive side waterproofing, um, and really limited to use on hairline cracks and not not suitable for for dynamic cracking. So again, the we call it waterproofing, but um, yeah, if it's not, if it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have any uh, any effect against dynamic cracks. Well, it, it's not really much of a waterproofing treatment, in my view. Um, mineral silicates; uh, these can be incorporated in, ad, in an admixture as well, or as a topical densifier. Um, when combined with inorganic pigments, these mineral silicates are also used as can also be used as a decorative finish. Uh, the silicate reacts with the calcium hydroxide in the uh, in the concrete to create calcium silicate hydrate. This much the same as the uh, the uh, crystalline um, treatment we saw on the last slide um, fills the open pores within the concrete uh, vacated by the evaporating water. Um, again, not really a truly speaking, not really a waterproofing system as will not bridge cracks or prevent cracking. Um, it can produce, uh, when used as a coating, it can often produce an uneven color and finish uh, due to the variations in, within the concrete mix. Uh, it does create a permanent bond with the substrate and has some positive attributes in reducing the incidence of uh, efflorescence. Mm -hmm. And typically these, um, these uh, densifiers are in, uh, incorporate uh, sodium, potassium or, or lithium silicate. And just a couple of examples where typical uses might, you might encounter. There on the right. Uh, water repellents. Um, we encounter these usually as uh, silanes, siloxanes. Uh, those are the two uh, most common penetrating water repellents and sealants. Um, they remain vapor permeable, non-film forming. They don't typically transfer uh, transform the the appearance of the concrete much beyond its uh, its natural gray color. Um, they can be used horizontally and vertically. <clears throat> They do weather over time and do require a uh, 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 reapplications as they do weather away. And once again, not a true waterproof system in the in the strict sense of the word. Um, the silanes chemically react with calcium hydroxide in the concrete uh, to form a hydrophobic layer within the pores and on the surface of the concrete. Um, really only effective on concrete or masonry and um, penetrates uh, much, much deeper than the than the siloxane. It does require that calcium hydroxide to, to react with. Siloxanes, on the other hand, react in uh, atmospheric 
uh, act with react, react with atmospheric moisture and the moisture within the substrate and they then you can use those on um, non cementitious materials like clay brick and stone but then we get to my favorite uh, masonry waterproof coatings um, and in my view there is actually no substitute for a protective coating barrier between the substrate and the elements responsible for its deterioration uh, protect it against uh, moisture infiltration, provide crack bridging, and doing so we can also protect against CO2 diffusion as well as chloride ingress. Uh, and along with the protective barrier, a coating will provide some aesthetic value. And it's just me, but uh, it's so much more appealing than, uh, than uh, just uh, uncoated uh, gray concrete. Um, because of this, coatings will extend the deferred maintenance of a structure and ultimately increase the lifespan of a building. Uh, the selection and application of the right coating systems uh, are important to mitigate uh, adverse environmental effects. Um, compensate for, to some degree, they'll compensate for defects in placement and overcome some of the inherent problems with, with concrete. Uh, concrete can be a very challenging su a material or a substrate to, to, to paint on or a material to work with. Um, and as a coatings manufacturer, our challenge is to design a breathable, waterproofing and protective coating systems to maximize the potential of uh, service life potential of the concrete structure. And it's important to know that not all coatings are created equal, uh, and therefore are vital to understand some of the uh, information presented to us in making the, uh, and, and interpret that information to select an optimum system design. Um, you know, we're faced with uh, latents or dusting on, the, on, a, uh, on, a, on a concrete surface due to perhaps overwatering of a, uh, a concrete mix, and that creates a bond breaker right there, as you see on the right. The high moisture content in concrete, 5% and above typically, um, can create issues with that uh, vapor drive, and I'm sure most of us online here um, appreciate the, uh, the, 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 the blistering that might occur on a, on a coating uh, when, uh, when concrete is moved into the sun or um, shortly after coating. And then the, the high pH of, a, um, of, uh, of freshly poured concrete or, or stucco um, can damage um, poorly chosen con uh, coating systems uh, with alkali burn or saponification. As, and that example there on the left. And then of course, the, uh, our old enemy of um, efflorescence occurring due to uh, moisture within the, um, within the structure, liberating these, uh, these uh, soluble salts to the surface. And to understand the, 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 the comment about not all coatings created equal, um, you know, competition's good and there's lots of paint and coatings manufacturers out there. And to some degree, coating or paint coating paint companies have inherited access to our commercial coatings market. Paints and coatings are quite different. They 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 satisfy two different uh, uh, two different needs. They're, they're built on the same same four building blocks. But um, I'll I'll, make, I'll I'll expand on that thought a little bit. But uh, it wasn't that long ago that Master Spec really only used paint brands with national coverage. So, and those specifically are Sean Williams, ICI, uh, Glidden, Benjamin Moore, and PPG. Those were the, the four basics for, for the master spec um, specification system. Um, in 2003, to give um, some of those regional paint companies a bit of an entry into this space, they incorporated or accepted that um, uh, manufacturers with Master Painters Institute qualifications or approvals could also be incorporated into the master spec as well as, as uh, the four nationals. So even today, my MPI, Master Paint and Institute uh, product approvals are essentially paint companies. The only two I, I, uh, I can detect there other than those are MAPEA and Euclid. So you can see there the, um, the that index, I think that, uh, that was copyrighted in uh, 2012, um, but it's actually the, uh, the table of contents for the master format of 1990, 1995. So, as I said, there are these legacy uh, painting coatings and painting specifications out there. So, 
um, we can end up in a situation where the specifiers are now having to put in comments in their specifications like this, so that residential products are not permitted, but then the, the list of approved manufacturers, acceptable paint manufacturers, well, most of those guys are actually residential paint product manufacturers. Um, and you can see there on the left side where the um, MPI product approval um, will get you entry into the uh, entry into this specification. But, yeah, so I think enough said on that. You'll understand that um, there are paint and Cody's manufacturers out there competing now in the same space. Uh, and uh, obviously with, with products of varying quality. And I'll bring this slide in just uh, as a comparison of a specialty facade coating, uh, specifically for waterproofing and protection of, uh, of concrete substrates versus a paint company out there that has produced their own facade coating and a paint company. And frankly, these are, these are three products that uh, we encounter regularly in, uh, in uh, facade restoration specifications. And while they are sort of relatively similar in terms of their physical attributes and and uh, and volume solids, um, the, you can see that the uh, the higher solids uh, coatings products um, actually do offer some uh, advantages in terms of higher film build, um, application efficiency, and uh, you know, a, a higher film build equals a um, better film integrity over time. But then we jump down a little bit and have it start having a look at the uh, performance tests. And you can see there that the, the manufacturer that's gone to the extra effort of um, getting an independently, their products independently verified and uh, validated by the uh, Sealand Waterproofing Restoration Institute has has a lot more test data to be able to convince you as a uh, as a specifier that this is the right product to use rather than trading on a on a brand name that's been around for a long time and uh, and trusting that that uh, it it will be okay on the day um, you can see there that the, the the test data just doesn't exist so I think I hope I make a the case there that you know these products have um, have their application, all these paint products have their applications, so do the coatings, but they shouldn't really be confused and um, attempt to be used on the on the same uh, on the same on the same structure and expect a, a, a similar result. They're really quite two different uh, two different beasts. Um, you'll see um, coatings manufacturers will trot out a, a CO2 diffusion test. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, science behind this, but really at the end of the day, we're talking about creating a uh, an effective carbonation barrier to prevent that wave front from even entering the concrete. And where you'll see a a, a, a tech data sheet from a manufacturer with anything an R value, um, not to be confused with uh, insulation, but um, an R value in excess of 50 meters. This means that um, it will prevent that carbonation wave front from re reaching the reinforcing steel in a uh, in uh, in 60 years. So we're talking a, a, a very effective uh, um, carbonation barrier. Um, to put that in other terms, if you wanted to have the uh, give your concrete the, the the same protection as that one coat of or, or that one application of uh, a paint or coating. Um, you'd need to apply something in the order of another 22 inches of concrete as a sacrificial layer um, to, to provide your uh, provide your structure with the same uh, same protection. Uh, waterproofing and weatherproofing, and really the only test that we offer you is a weatherproofing test, and that is the uh, the wind driven rain test. Um, this superseded the uh, the Fed Spec 555B back in 2001. Uh, but it simulates exposure to continuous rain at uh, at a pressure of 98 miles an hour wind velocity. Um, it's it's typically just a uh, a visual inspection, but some uh, some manufacturers will go so far as to present you with a uh, a differential weight gain before and after the test, as you see there at the bottom. Water vapor 
permeance and permeability. And this is a this is a real mind bender. There are four different tests: wet and dry cup, as well as the ASTM 1653 and E96. But uh, essentially, um, the the coatings industry has really fallen in behind the ASTM uh, 1653. However, what it does in the uh, in the first uh, process of its, its its measurement is um, determine water vapor transmission WVT, which is uh, grams per square meter per 24 hour cycle. Then a calculation gives you water vapor permeance. And this only measures a rate of transmission or permeance. So to compare two coatings, you really, they really have to be of the same thickness. And the calculations within the test of uh, ASTM D 1653 doesn't actually go that far. It doesn't actually take that step to calculate permeability. ASTM E96 actually measures permeability, also expressed in terms, but a film thickness needs to be greater than half an inch thick, and there are all sorts of adjustments that need to be made, and it really, at that thickness, it's really not a practical measurement for organic paint films. Permeability is the only means to compare competing coatings at, at different thicknesses, so uh, pay attention when you're looking at the uh, test results for ASTM D 60, 1653. Manufacturers should provide you with the perms and the film thickness at which it was uh, with, at which it was tested, because it is a linear relationship. Twice the thickness is half the permeability. So you need, need to take that into into account. Um, chloride ion permeability. This uh, this is a bit of a red herring in my mind and a waste of space. Um, because the test is conducted on concrete, and concrete within this, uh, within this, uh, the confines of this uh, test, ASTM 1202, concrete already has a very low chloride ion permeability. So when you see a test like this and uh, a manufacturer claiming, oh, well, it has a, a low permeability class, it really means that hey, the concrete was doing its job anyway without the coating. Elongation and tensile strength, there are three different tests for this. And that sadly, not many of these ASTMs were developed with the coatings industry in mind. So we've had to adopt, modify, and apply as, uh, as, we, as we see fit. But, um, you know, the test method and the apparatus are similar, but the results of these three tests really can't be correlated. Um, it's strange, though, that SWRI, Sealand Waterproofing Restoration Institute, should actually fall in behind ASTM D412, because strictly speaking, that test requirement is a, a film thickness at 118 mils, about 10 times the normal thickness of a of a uh, of a facade coating or a waterproof coating. Um, and this, here here lies some of the problems with this, because now the manufacturer or the or the, or the test criteria has been modified um, to application thicknesses, where it does actually reflect. A, a real life application, but um, you're not to know that until uh, until you know it. So, uh, crack bridging is a uh, is another interesting one here, and this really um, obviously an important test from the point of view of concrete. We know it it is going to crack sooner or later, and it uh, tests the ability of a coating to bridge dynamic cracks um, and with, withstand movement without failure of the coating. Um, There is um, uh, ASTM thirteen oh five is a uh, is a as a pass fail test that uh, just um, provides test results at two temperatures, uh, freezing and at uh, normal uh, seventy three degree Fahrenheit room temperatures, uh, or seventy five, excuse me. Um, and again, the the test procedure is some it can be modified uh, to to suit uh, an individual's ends. But um, I think it's important here to reference the uh, the uh, Construction Specifier magazine article back in July 2013, where they actually uh, assessed the performance claims of 14 manufacturers with their elastomeric coatings that said they all passed uh, at recommended uh, dry film thicknesses. Um, they ran a... Uh, a subsequent test and found that really only nine of the 14 passed at 75 degrees and even fewer passed at, uh, at freezing temperatures. 
so it's um there there are test biases i no doubt but there are also um um test execution bias as well so um swr i have um uh, adopted the uh, EN 1062-7, uh, which is a European standard. And that reflects more, rather than the pass fail at these two temperatures, it reflects the coating's ability to stretch at three different, or bridge a crack at three different um, temperatures. So it gives manufacturers a little bit more of, uh, a little bit more uh, latitude in terms of the, uh, in terms of displaying meaningful data to a specifier. Flexibility, once again, important if we're talking about concrete and wanting to uh, wrap our coatings around uh, sharp edges, um, radius edges. Um, obviously, the, the ability of a coating to um, wrap a smaller angle is uh, and, and maintain its integrity is much better than um, something that wraps a, a, larger, a larger radius. But um, Typically on uh, on on data sheets, you're not uh, you're not party to know whether that's a quarter of an inch um, or a one inch mandrel that it's passed on. Adhesion testing, it'd, it'd be great to know that uh, the products we're specifying actually adhere to the uh, the concrete substrate to which they're applied. And there are there are uh, you know it's it's a great test because it provides you a quantitative uh, result. It gives you a hard number that. Hey, it requires this many PSI to remove this coating from this facade. Um, unfortunately, there are five different uh, five different test apparatus, and a testing bias now becomes a factor in, uh, as a result of the uh, various apparatus that are used. But great again for a uh, for a, uh, a comparative test where you have competing manufacturers on the wall, or you want to test the adhesion of the existing coating versus the effects of applying the new coating. But um, as, a, as an absolute number, um, there's, n there's not, a lot of, uh, not a lot of frame of reference there. Simulated accelerated weathering. Well, this is the, um, this is the automotive crash test um, of the coatings industry. Um, we, uh, we simulate accelerated weathering by uh, applying our coatings to these test samples and exposing them to rigorous um, uh, rigorous weathering cycles in, in uh, lab uh, laboratory uh, conditions. Um, they incorporate a high intensity light source, temperature, humidity, um, continuous, and we expose these for continuous cycles of uh, thousands of hours, 5,000 hours and actually seven months in real time. Um, depending on the failure mode, 3,000 hours in a xenon arc exposure, uh, exposure chamber yields similar results to a 60-month exposure in South Florida. And that's a pretty extreme environment with UV, salt latency air, winds and rain. But um, not, not all failure modes are replicated using these simulated accelerated weathering tests. And some of these weathering tests are, uh, are more aggressive than others. Some, some are simply a, a UV light bulb. Others are uh, the xenon arc um, weather weatherometers, but sadly, um, thing well things do change, uh, and sadly, some of our uh, competition are caught out with these changing requirements. Although you can see here, they're still publishing this data um, even today, 20 years after the ASTM standard has been withdrawn as accurate and current information on the performance of their product. So something to be a little bit be a little bit aware of, uh, because certainly those two uh, ASTM tests have been uh, have been replaced. So in summary, uh, with the selection and application of the right coding system, adverse environmental effects can be mitigated and some degree compensate for defects in placement to extend the and optimize the surface life of the structure. I think I, I said that at the beginning, and uh, I hope it, I hope I make that case too, but. Uh, the term paint and coatings can be and is used interchangeably, and I fall into that trap myself, um, except coatings have really become more commonly associated with specialized applications like waterproofing and corrosion protection. Coatings satisfy a much higher performance standard than paint, 
and have testing credentials to differentiate the product performance from paint. Architectural and decorative paints that you and I use on our own homes, a fully matured and commoditized market segment, very few differentiators in the product, and consumers are aligned more by the distribution channel and store type that we go to the hardware store or the big box store for our for our DIY product. Uh, you'll find the, uh, the painting contractors will be driven more to the company stores where coatings applicators or commercial construction guys are working with specialized distribution outlets and manufacturers to provide the right product for that for that application. Commercial construction, uh, construction is driven by specifications and these thin film architectural paints simply don't measure up to performance demands. And as uh, as Princess was reading my uh, my resume back there, I've been in the industry a, a, a substantial amount of time, and yeah, I, I do really I really do appreciate the differences between paints and coatings these days. In the longer term, the substrate repairs and coatings are going to be inevitable, but maintenance can be deferred, and for that small incremental cost in the overall construction budget, a properly designed coating system will protect that masonry construction against early onset of deterioration for, for years. Uh, work with trusted manufacturers with credentials in the specific field of application. Manufacturers equally have a, a great responsibility to the industry to provide reliable and transparent reporting. Um, I get it, they all want to make, make sales, make a profit, support their, uh, support their shareholders. But if, if, uh, if they're not going to tell you the whole story and 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 provide you with a uh, provide you with the robust system you're looking for, um, yeah, that's that's not transparent. So to the specifier, I'll ask you simply ask the questions, um, challenge erroneous data, and get a second opinion. Um, guys in my position will be glad to, even if we're not on the spec, we'll be glad to provide you with uh, uh, perhaps a, an objective point of view as well. So. With that, that, that concludes the presentation. Um, before you ring off, I want to thank you very much for, for attending this afternoon. Um, this does uh, qualify for uh, learning units, both with the uh, AIA as well as uh, any engineers out there with RCEP. Um, so hopefully we have your registration details that we can provide you with the, uh, the certificates and, uh, and uh, the credit. So question time. Um, by all means, type in there on your control panel a, a question and Princess is going to come to those. Um, or if uh, something after we all sign off, if something comes to mind, take down my, uh, my name, cell and uh, email address if you like. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, happy to discuss any of these aspects with you in, 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 in some more detail. So Princess is going to be our, uh, our moderator here. And uh, I'll hand it back to her to see if they've had any uh, had any questions. Thank you, Rankin. Um, that was a really great presentation. A lot of good information. We have a few questions here. I'll start off with this one. Um, do you offer targeted technical symposiums that would focus on specific product applications for us? Oh, absolutely. We'd be more than happy to do that. And considering the current environment we're living in, uh, we'd be happy to do that either uh, remotely. Um, we can we can set up these uh, these webinars um, with on, on a variety of different platforms. Um, we can tailor it to whatever your office needs. Um, we have uh, dozens more of these uh, AIA or RCEP presentations. We can also provide if you're looking for credit. Um, but certainly, we'd be um, we'd be honoured to. Uh, to put put something tailored together for your for your particular office. Uh, glad to do that. And I should actually just jump in there and say if there's uh, if you'd like a little bit more information about uh, uh, Mape coatings, um, you'll see there on the control panel and a uh, our coatings brochure, our PDF, and that'll sort of take you a little bit more into the discussion about um, uh, facade coatings. Thanks. Okay, here's one more. Is crack bridging functions of tensile strength and elongation? How much CB is optimum? Oh, good question. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, um, crack bridging is a function of um, elongation and tensile strength. 
um, elongation being the important one, tensile strength being the 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 the, uh, the force required to create that elongation. So um, the the tests are different, but um, they are related. I should put it that way. Um, when we're coding a, when we're coding a structure, we start with I'm assuming a zero uh, a zero crack or a hairline crack, and the um, the uh, 1062-7 test, the European standard, um, does actually start from zero and uh, elongates or expands that crack at a specific um, rate and um, observes for a any minor fracturing in the coating. The elongation, the, the other ASTM tests that I referred to earlier, those also expand at a given, uh, given uh, head speed or a, a given rate, but usually those, um, the, the elongation is measured at failure, at complete failure, where the, where the, uh, the, the, the coding sample snaps, rather than identifying an early failure or an early pinhole in the, uh, in the crack bridging test. Um, very few manufacturers offer that crack bridging data. Um, and more to the point, very few manufacturers offer that crack bridging data that's been validated. So you're not going to go very far to find that uh, there are only probably only two or three manufacturers that offer that. So you, your choice is limited. But um, yeah, I think that, that's probably where I'd leave it. Like if, if that individual would like to write to me, I'd, I'd be happy to expand on that a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Here's another question uh, from Carlos. Is there any specific coating for salt front concrete? Salt front concrete. Is that, did, mm -hmm. I read, did, did I get that right? Yeah, salt front concrete. Uh, apparently well, I, he works I, I, on rebar. I'm sorry? He works on rebar and he wants to know if there's a way to add uh, extra protection. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think the, the important thing is when you're doing the doing the restoration is to try and um, uh, mitigate that uh, mitigate the, uh, the the chloride ingress or uh, or not encapsulate any more salt in there. So I don't leave it exposed too long. Um, make sure it is um, appropriately appropriately sealed or, or coated. And there are um, specific um, rebar coatings. Actually, even within our line, we've got some very good uh, anti-corrosives that can be applied to the rebar to arrest that uh, arrest that um, that uh, corrosion. And then, of course, uh, the application of the right mortar to backfill, and then ultimately a coating that will give you a uh, um, some some chloride protection. Um, any coating will give you some some degree of protection, or any paint will give you some degree of protection. But a coating will be the way to go. And again, a a coating that's engineered for these building facades in these these uh, these severe environments. Okay, perfect. And then we have one last question. Um, you mentioned sodium, potassium, and lithium silicates in connection to densifiers and mineral silicate paints. What's the difference? Aha, another good question. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit out of my depth when I'm talking about um, uh, about densifiers, but um, I'll have a shot at this. But essentially, the um, uh, mineral silicate paints usually incorporate sodium silicates. Um, you may also hear those referred to as as water glass. That's uh, it's a fairly old technology, but um, useful from the point of view that I mentioned earlier that they they actually um, create a chemical bond with the uh, with the concrete um, but in the same way as they they react and form that chemical bond so do den densifiers and um, each of those chemicals um, the sodium lithium or potassium work in much the same way they uh, they uh, produce the same chemical reaction but price is the uh, price is probably the main driver uh, the sodium products, uh, sodium silicates are, are typically cheaper um, than the potassium or lithium. 
the application is slightly different too. Um, sodium typically you you pour that out on the uh, on the on the surface and needs to be broomed and agitated during the uh, during during the reaction phase uh, and then um, neutralized and rinsed off. Um, lithium and potassium silicate densifiers um, generally just sprayed onto the surface and uh, no rinsing required. Uh, but uh, don't take my word for it. Read the manufacturer's label when you get to that point. But um, those are the really the, the, the differences that I understand. I hope that uh, hope that helped. Are you there, Princess? Yes. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Reagan, <laughs> Welcome <Anna>. back. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, although this is the close of the webinar, we don't have any more questions. If you do have more questions, please email Rankin at rjs at mapay.com, or you can reach out to mapay digital at mapay.com. The webinar recording will be made available and can be emailed out at request. Um, if you signed in with your AIA number, you will receive a certificate in your email. Uh, thank you for attending and thank you, Rankin, for your presentation. Appreciate it, Princess, and thank you again to all that attended today. Um, I wish you well. Take care. Goodbye, everyone.